Uh, thanks so much, Lou. It's uh, really my <clears throat> pleasure and honor to be here and to talk about something very close to my heart, which is cortical development. Uh, I do direct a stem cell program, but it's a program in developmental and stem cell biology. And it's a very close relationship, as I'm sure you all know, between uh, development and the use of stem cells to essentially reproduce many of those early developmental events. Um, what I'm interested in is cortical development. And uh, as Lou suggested, the human cortex, or primates as well, are very different than the rodent models that most people use when modeling development or disease. And so I thought that today I would uh, really focus my comments on uh, underscoring some of the more recently appreciated differences um, in very broad strokes between human brain development and the rodents that many of, our, many of us are most familiar with and end with some uh, translational implications for some of the basic research, uh, underscoring again the theme that if you really understand basic uh, neurobiology well enough, there will boundless be some form of, of clinical translation. And I want to just emphasize some of those uh, toward the end. <clears throat> I was also told to uh, keep my comments addressed to a relatively broad audience. And so um, if anyone wants to get into deeper detail in the question period, that would be terrific. Um, so I wanted to start with some of the very obvious differences between the human brain and the rodent brain. There's a thousand-fold increase in size. Um, but I just wanted to make sure we all appreciate that the human brain is neither the most folded or the biggest brain among mammals. Both elephants and cetaceans, like whales and porpoises, have bigger brains, and the cortex is larger in surface area. It's more highly folded. But if you count the number of cells, as uh, Herculano Mazzola and others have done, uh, the elephant, for example, although much larger, has a third uh, fewer cortical neurons than in the human brain. Cerebellum is larger and has more neurons in, in the granule cells in the cerebellum. But in terms of cortical number, the human brain is still the largest in terms of total numbers. Um, and most non-human uh, primates have a third or smaller size brains with a third or fewer numbers of neurons. So, so the question then becomes how these neurons are produced in early development and what are the steps that really led to this huge uh, expansion in numbers. And that's what I want to focus on in the, in the next few minutes. First, I just want to review what we know about the rodent uh, development uh, pattern, and that's shown uh, graphically here. On the left side are the neuroepithelial cells that go through symmetrical divisions to expand their number. And at neurogenesis, they transform into radioglia, and they start going through asymmetrical divisions. And they don't usually produce neurons directly, but instead they produce, produce the daughter cells, which we call intermediate progenitors and uh, others have been calling them basal progenitors. They divide in the rodent once to produce pairs of neurons, so it's a terminal division. And that continues about 12 cycles until the end of neurogenesis when the radioglia transform into glial cells, astrocytes. And that's one of the reasons why radioglia are now often referred to as neural stem cells, because they can make a variety of different types of neurons, and they also make non-neural glial cells. Um, Neuroepithelial cells are the founder population, and they can also be referred to as neural stem cells. And I'll talk about the distinction in just a few minutes. Now, how does that compare to uh, human development? Well, on the left is a cross-section of a uh, fetal or embryonic mouse where the radioglial cells are shown in red, and their daughter cells, the intermediate progenitors, are in uh, green, stained with two different transcription factors that they express. And if you look at early stages of uh, human cortical development, when the deeper cortical cells are being produced, it looks very much the same in the progenitor zone. There are radioglial cells that are stained here in red, and there are the intermediate progenitors in green. But very quickly after that stage, the subventricular zone becomes hugely expanded in this outer subventricular zone. And the last image I show is gestation week 17 in human development. It's not the end of corticogenesis. It's actually halfway through. At that stage, it's the middle cortical layers that are being produced. And I hope you can appreciate already that the ventricular zone, the red area, has now become very, very small. And the outer subventricular zone is, is really huge. And that suggests, and it also suggested to scientists 50 years ago, that that zone, the outer subventricular zone, must contribute to a lot of the cortical layers in later neurogenesis, the upper cortical layers in particular. But the cell types in that zone have really not been studied. And the colors you see there are stained for cells at different phases in the cell cycle. So these are all progenitors that are going through cell cycle events. And they hadn't really been very well described. So we started looking, and others, uh, about five years ago, what those cells might look like, first of all, using the uh, markers for progenitors that have been developed in the rodent. And there were two major classes of progenitors in that region I want to talk about. One are radioglia-like cells. And on the left, you can see the morphology of these cells. They have a basal fiber that goes up toward the surface of the cortex. They don't have a uh, apical fiber, no connection to the ventricular zone where those ventricular radioglia used to be or are still at this stage. Uh, 
they otherwise stain with all the markers uh, that have been developed for radioglia in the rodent, bimentin, nestin, intermediate filaments, SOX2, PAC6. In fact, at the time, five years ago, there were no unique markers to distinguish these cells from the more well-studied ventricular radioglia. But they're morphologically distinct. They're located in a very distinct area. Uh, shown here on the left, you can backfill their processes with a lipophilic dye like dye I at the surface of the cortex, so they project fibers all the way up to the peel surface. And so uh, they hadn't been described before, and we call them outer subventricular zone radioglia-like cells, which is a mouthful. <clears throat> so we abbreviated that as ORG cells or org cells. And Wieland Utner in Germany is now referring to them as basal radioglia, but uh, we uh, labeled them first. It's my talk, and we'll be calling them ORG cells for the rest of the hour. Now, we're lucky at UCSF that we get uh, donated material that we can uh, treat the same way we do our uh, rodent material, which in this case we've stained using a, uh, a virus, a lentivirus that's expressing a promoter-driven GFP for progenitor cells. So we can't see the neurons in this image. They're there, but they're invisible. These are all progenitor cells in the outer subventricular zone over about uh, 24 hours of imaging. And you can see how dynamic that area is. The progenitors are uh, moving mostly in the upward or radial direction, and many of them are dividing. And the way they divide um, is, is very characteristic for each population of progenitor. And I want to emphasize that and focus first on the neuroepithelial cells and radioglia, which as they mature and change, as you'll see later on transcriptionally, they also change dynamically in their mitotic behavior. <clears throat> Some of these behaviors have been described very well before. Uh, here on the left are ventricular zone radioglia, and they're undergoing interkinetic nuclear migration that brings the nucleus to the ventricular surface every time they go through mitosis. Uh, that's very well described, and that occurs, as you saw here, in neuroepithelial early stages in, in human development. But then later, as they transform, um, I'm sorry, let me just focus on that for a, a minute in a, a more uh, a complete description of how they go through neuroepithelial stage divisions. So if you look at the cells on the left, um, the fiber, the basal fiber of one of these progenitors retracts, the cell divides, and then both daughter cells regrow their fibers. Uh, you'll see again, uh, the little arrows will point to a cell just before it divides. Fiber retracts, the two daughters are created, and they both regrow their fibers. And this happens uh, over and over again during that uh, phase of what are known as the founder population expansion. When the neural plate grows and the neural tube closes, those are the patterns of divisions that you see. And they're symmetrical. We think the fates of the daughter cells are identical. And that changes when the cells actually reach uh, neurogenic stages. Uh, then what happens, and I think we can show that, sorry, yeah, these are slice cultures. Yeah, exactly. So this is now looking at a rodent, but the same thing happens in humans when they become radioglial cells. So the radial fiber doesn't retract. Uh, it remains uh, in place, and that also helps support neuronal migration, which is occurring along that fiber. But the cell divides at the ventricular surface, and then the daughter cell, which is the one now with the white triangle, and the parent cell nucleus, which is the red triangle, both move away from the ventricle. Uh, there's a, a, a sojourn for 24 hours as the daughter cells stay in that zone for, uh, for a day or so, and then start migrating. And I hope you can appreciate the daughter cell is migrating along the parental fiber. Meanwhile, the original radioglial cell goes through another asymmetrical division at the ventricle to produce another daughter cell. And that happens over and over again. But the daughter cell is not a neuron. As you'll see now, it rounds up and divides. So these are the intermediate progenitors I highlighted earlier. And they divide once, shown here, with a horizontal cleavage. We can talk about orientation of spindles if you'd like. And then those two cells differentiate as neurons, and they migrate together. And we think they're identical pyramidal cells that go to the same layer of the cortex. And that's the pattern of neurogenesis that I diagrammed earlier that happens over and over again uh, in, in the mouse. So unlike the neuroepithelial cells, which retract the fibers and regrow their fibers, as you saw, one of the two daughters in the radioglial division inherits the fiber, and the other one loses the fiber and becomes a different cell type. Now, the outer radioglia that I mentioned uh, undergo yet a different pattern of division. So I just want to show you one cell because it's easier to see if there's just a single cell in the field. And this is in the outer subventricular zone, one of these basal glial fibers. And when it gets ready to divide, it jumps and divides. Very different than the patterns you saw in the other two cell divisions. And that doesn't happen in all outer radioglial divisions, but 80% of the human cells we've imaged, we've used hundreds of them, will jump and divide just like that. And the cell at the top is the self-renewed radioglial cell. And the daughter cell that's below is a kind of transit amplifying cell. So these different dynamic behaviors might all be related to each other. They may be driven by the same motors uh, or not. And so um, we 
who suspected that the interkinetic nuclear migration diagram on the left, which had been studied by others, uh, is driven by a similar motor that drives the mitotic somal translocation, which is, by the way, what we're calling those jumps and divisions, MSTs or mitotic somal translocation. And what happens just before division of a ventricular radioglia shown here is the nucleus moves toward the centrosomes at the ventricular surface by these microtubules that actually surround the nucleus. And so the microtubule motors drive this stage of the, mo of the motion, the nucleus to the ventricle, just prior to mitosis. And uh, it seemed reasonable at the time to assume that this jump in division in a similarly related radioglia-like cell was essentially the same as this, but just inverted 180 degrees so that the centrosome was in the leading process, and then the uh, nucleus would be pulled by microtubules up to that process before it divided. Essentially the same thing happening, but just 180 degrees. And we published that, as you might see, in 2012 um, as a possible mechanism. And so a year or two later, I had a uh, MSTP student actually in the lab who decided to test the idea. And uh, just like some of my fondest ideas, it's totally wrong. And to show how wrong it is, I want to show you what happened when we blocked microtubules and predicted that it would prevent the cells from jumping. So we did this actually in culture with uh, nacotazole, uh, which is the cell on the right. I hope you'll see that in a minute. This may be happening a little more slowly than I'm usually. Let's try it again. Here we are. So the cell on the left we thought would jump, would not jump at all in, oh, whoops, hold on. This is the wrong film. Let me go back. Um, so is this going to be the right one? I'll, I'll see you in a second. Right. So uh, nacotazole on the right blocked the microtubules, disaggregated them. And we didn't expect the cell to jump at all. And as you can see, it actually jumped further than the control cells. And after jumping, it failed to divide, as you'd expect, because you need microtubules and uh, you know, the uh, uh, spindle to, to actually uh, lead to cytokinesis. So it, it didn't block the jump, but it blocked the cell division. And to make a long story short, it wasn't until we blocked the actomycin fibers with blepistatin, which you'll see here on the right, that we're able to prevent the cell from jumping. So if you block non-muscle myosin 2, as shown here, the cells fail to jump, but they do go ahead and, and divide. So you can, you can dissociate the cell division from the jump. And experiments along these lines uh, confirmed that uh, this was the pathway that led to the jump. It's very different than what we thought. It's not the microtubule motors that you see in interkinetic nuclear migration. Instead, it's rho activation of rock that uh, phosphorylates non-muscle myosin 2 leads to the contraction and, and drives the jump. Now, what's interesting about this, this set of steps is that the genes underlying some of these are shown on the right. And some of you may recognize there are mutations to most of these genes that produce major cortical malformations in the human brain. What's also interesting about those is that they don't produce major malformations in the mouse. And I just want to give you one example. Uh, this is a normal uh, sized human brain. The one on the right is from a patient who has a mutation in ASPM, which is a centrosome-related uh, gene, resulting in microcephaly. So the brain on the right is a third the normal size. Now, that's the phenotype in humans with that mutation. In the mouse, when you create the same mutation, shown here on the right, it does make a slightly smaller brain, you know, but in no way is that a third the size of the normal brain. It, it's a subtle defect. And many other mutations in some of those other genes produce actually no phenotype that people have seen in a mouse. So I'll come back to this at the end of the talk, but it suggests that there might be uh, a phase of human brain development that's not mirrored in the mouse, where you know, the phenotypes for these kinds of mutations might make a, a major impact. And the outer subventricular progenitors, which aren't present in the mouse, are possible targets for those, for those uh, mutations. And we'll talk about microcephaly uh, to sort of complete the circle later on. Now, when we first described these uh, neurogenic progenitors, uh, the issue was, uh, how can we be sure that they're not gliogenic? And, and the motivation for that question was that for many, many years, in fact, uh, almost 100 years, it was thought that the outer subventricular zone, that hugely expanded zone, was largely a gliogenic region, that astrocytes and oligodendrocytes came from the progenitors there. So in order to show that these outer radioglia I just talked about were neurogenic, uh, we developed several approaches. But I just want to talk about this one, where we dissociated the progenitor zone, labeled the cells with our uh, favorite markers, dissociated them into individual cells which were distributed into wells like this with one cell in each well. And the cell, I hope you can see in that little box, is shown at higher magnification on the right. And then we time-lapse imaged these cells for about a week. And the pattern of division told us the identity of the cell based on what I've told you already. 
this cell, uh, when it gets ready to divide, puts out a process and jumps along the process and divides. And that behavior we see with ORG cells, not with the intermediate progenitors, where they retract all their fibers, they don't jump, and then divide. So we identify these cells, like this one, for instance, as an outer radioglial cell in that well. And then the daughters divide, and the uh, original progenitor divides. And this happens over and over again. After a week, we could no longer actually tell who was who. We then put these cells into an incubator for another seven weeks, long enough so that they could develop whatever kind of clonal uh, daughter cells they would normally produce. And in these clones, we typically saw 700 to 1,000 cells. So this is what that particular clone looked like seven weeks later. And when we stain for different neuronal markers, in this case, TBR1 for deeper cortical layer cells and CUX1 for upper cortical layer cells, what was interesting is the single outer radioglial cell produced not only 1,000 or so, 700 cells, but it produced over time both deep and upper cortical layer neurons. And some of the clones, in addition, included astrocytes. So this told us that at least these ORG cells had the uh, ability to generate neurons of different types and also sometimes glial as well as neuronal cells. But they all included neurons. Some did or didn't have astrocytes, but they all had neurons. So we felt this uh, confirmed that these were really neurogenic at the ages that we, uh, that we assumed they were. Was there a question already? I, uh, no, okay. If there are questions while we, uh, during the talk, I'm happy to, to answer them. So how are the outer radioglial cells generated? And uh, it had been noticed some years ago uh, by uh, Sue McConnell when she studied ferrets that unlike the mouse, where all the ventricular radioglia divide with a vertical cleavage plane, in the ferret, uh, there were uh, periods halfway through neurogenesis when there were both vertical and horizontal divisions. And we, whoops, and we uh, looked in a uh, human developing ventricular zone and saw the same thing, that especially halfway through neurogenesis, and there are many cells here that come to the ventricle and divide. Some of them have vertical cleavages, and others have horizontal cleavages. And what's interesting about that is, first, it's different than the mouse, where throughout neurogenesis, 90% of the divisions are all vertical. So what happens with these horizontal divisions? So with a vertical division, as shown up on the top, um, the fate of the daughter cells is exactly the same as in the mouse. That is, even though it's a vertical division, the fate of the cells is asymmetrical. In this case, the cell on the left becomes a radioglial cell. The cell on the right becomes this intermediate progenitor-like cell. So the vertical divisions in humans look very much like the vertical divisions in the mouse. The horizontal divisions, shown here on the bottom, obviously uh, uh, dissociate that basal fiber from the apical fiber. So the basal fiber is inherited by the cell on the top, and the apical contact is inherited by the cell at the bottom. Vice versa, they each lose their, you know, the opposite contact. What happens then is the cell that's connected up to the peel surface moves away, and in its next division, and if you look at the uh, image up on the right, I hope you can see this one, um, it jumps and divides. So when there's a horizontal division, it looks like the basal daughter cell becomes an outer radioglial-like cell. And so that, we think, is how most of these outer radioglial cells originate. Once they get to the outer subventricular zone, some of them undergo uh, symmetrical divisions where they produce daughters that are also outer radioglial, so they amplify the number of outer radioglial cells. But they initially come by inheriting the basal fiber from these ventricular radioglial cells. Now, uh, the other thing I wanted to emphasize is that these basal fibers of the outer radioglial cells support neuronal migration. And, and, th and that is shown in this case by a ferret uh, where we labeled the progenitor cells in green and neurons in red, and I hope you can see, this is a looped film, this red stained neuron uh, contacts this fiber and then migrates along the fiber up to the cortex. And we've seen you know, many examples of this, which confirms that, that these uh, outer radioglial fibers support neuronal migration. And, and that uh, is important for this model that we now have. It's a working model of, of primate and human corticogenesis, where unlike the rodent that has these ventricular radioglia, in, in the uh, human there are large numbers of outer radioglia they go through these asymmetrical self-renewing divisions, shown here in the middle. They produce daughter cells that, unlike the rodent, which divides only once, these daughter cells go through multiple rounds of division before producing a clone of neurons that then have the same birth date, migrate to the same cortical layer. And we think that ex accounts nicely for the cortical expansion, which is mostly tangential. In addition, the basal fibers of each of these glia support neuronal migration and create these little micro-columns of cells and can increase the number of cortical columns structurally within the developing cortex. At the end of neurogenesis, we're not sure yet uh, what happens to these outer radioglia, but I've already indicated we think they turn into or generate glial cells after the neurons are produced. 
And, and there are a few points I want to make now about uh, cortical folding, which I think is an interesting phenomenon, but I just want to make sure uh, that I make it clear that the outer radial glia we think are important for folding, but not the, uh, they're necessary, but not sufficient. Um, so the four major mamma mammalian families are uh, diagrammed here, and individuals are shown on the right. And what this shows is that for every major mammalian family, of which there are four, there are at least individual species that have gyrification or folded uh, uh, cortical surfaces. So on the top is a carnivore, the ferret, which, as you see, is in cross-section, has folded uh, uh, cortical surface. A capybara is a very large South American rodent, but it has a folded cortex. Humans and primates, of course, are folded, and the elephant, as I showed you earlier, is highly folded. Um, but those uh, species on the right each belong to the same family, but they're smooth or lysencephalic. Uh, you know, the uh, brown bat is a, a lysencephalic carnivore. Uh, mouse, of course, like most rodents, is lysencephalic. The Senegal bush baby is a primate, like the marmoset, which also has a, a, a lysencephalic cortex. And the manatee is uh, nearly lysencephalic. Uh, it's closely related to the elephant, but it's obviously much, much less folded. And so all of these, we now uh, believe, have outer radial glia and a large outer subventricular zone during early development. But they don't all have cort cortical folding. Um, but we don't think the folding can occur without outer radial glia. But clearly, it's not the only fi factor involved in, in development of folding. And during evolution, some species actually became less folded, lost their degree of folding. And others, of course, increased their level of folding. So folding is an interesting phenomenon we could discuss later. But I don't think it's directly related uh, to neurogenesis. Now, I mentioned we don't have markers for these cells, the outer radial glia, but it was clear that there must be genetic differences between those cells and the ventricular radial glia that I talked about earlier. And so we, over the last few years, have taken a number of approaches to try to come up with those markers and look more carefully at gene expression in these cells. And, and I just want to highlight what I think is the most successful approach, which was to do single-cell RNA sequencing in cells from the progenitor zones and also from uh, later stages in the cortex. And what we did in a collaboration with Fluidine, which is a company in South San Francisco that developed uh, one of the early platforms for doing this, this microfluidic chip that I'm showing you here in the, in the middle, we dissected the ventricular cells, dissociated them, and in an unsupervised way, we just collected the individual cells in these micro wells, uh, which then allowed us to do single cell reverse transcription and amplification and look at the RNA sequencing of individual cells captured from this progenitor zone. And shown on the right is a, a, a TISNY plot. It's based on the principal components uh, of, that distinguish these cells from each other. And they're clustered according to similarity. And we colored them because they express canonical genes that we can identify with specific cell types. So in yellow are uh, the cluster of cells that represent uh, radioglia-like cells. In uh, pink or red are the intermediate progenitor cells. Blue are the young excitatory neurons. And in black are the migratory interneurons. And, and in this uh, kind of a plot, you can almost see a lineage relationship going from radial glia to intermediate progenitor to young neuron. Uh, but to look more carefully at that lineage, uh, we actually were able to uh, distinguish uh, developmental trajectories based on the genes that these cells express. So just looking at the progenitor populations and the top uh, 20 or 30 genes that each of them express, you can distinguish the radial glia, which are shown here on the, on the lower left, uh, here by the genes. There's a heat map, obviously, that shows gene expression. And so these genes uh, are expressed by radial glia. Intermediate progenitors, as you can see, express uh, largely a different set of genes. And neurons, uh, yet more different genes. But there are some genes that are turned on in the radial glia or expressed highly there and persist in the intermediate progenitors, and others that are turned on in the intermediate progenitors that persist in the, in the neurons. And so I think it, it, it confirms, first of all, that the intermediate progenitors are literally intermediate between the radial glia they come from and the young neurons that they produce. But it also allows you to infer lineages in not only this trajectory, which we actually know already based on dynamic imaging, but some of the other lineages that we uh, haven't been able to image, we've now been able to infer based on this kind of gene expression pattern, which shown here on the left uh, very nicely traces the lineage of these excitatory cells. Now, to confirm the expression of some of these genes uniquely by the populations we talked about, we resor resorted to in situ hybridization shown on the right, uh, going back to the same human tissue sections. And they confirm that some of these marker genes are expressed in the populations that the data would predict. That leads me to this topic, which is namely, uh, did this study uh, reveal any novel markers or genes that we can use as markers for the cell types that we didn't have before? And the answer is yes. And not only that, but in a very useful way, they developed a set. We, we now have a set of markers for cell types we already had markers for, but they have advantages that the other markers didn't have. 
So uh, by just looking at the progenitor populations, we were able to distinguish ventricular radioglia very easily from outer radioglia uh, by their gene expression patterns. And here on the left are uh, novel genes that are data predict predicted at this stage would only be expressed by ventricular cells or ventricular radioglia. And the in situ hybridization uh, confirmed that these markers, every one of these genes is expressed and enriched in the ventricular radioglia. On the right are the genes that are even more interesting to me. These are the ones that we think would be unique to outer radioglia at these ages. And the in situ hybridization confirms that these genes are, in fact, enriched in outer radioglia in the outer subventricular zone. So we now have a range, actually a battery of markers that are unique for the different progenitor populations. And we use them to go back and look more carefully, not just in human development, but in other species, uh, to look at these cell types. Now, one other thing I want to mention, in addition to confirming uh, by in situ hybridization, we also have the advantage now of, of that unique behavior I talked about, mitotic somal translocation. So in time-lapse images, we saw cells jump and divide. We fixed them and stained them for these new markers and confirmed that these markers that were predicted to stain outer radioglia were staining the cells that were jumping and dividing in culture as well as in sections. So this very nicely confirmed that we have now a, a, a tool to look at these cells in particular. And in addition to, to just developing markers, the genes that distinguish the outer radioglia were very informative in terms of pathways, activated networks of genes, that gave us insight into the function and maybe even the origin of this cell type. Uh, and the reason is because they generally fell into three categories. Uh, one of them were genes that potentiated growth factor signaling, as shown here, tenacin C, which is sort of a hub gene for a whole range of growth factors that uh, we think are important for self-renewal of this population. Uh, LIF-R and STAT3, which is a, a pathway that many of you may know is uh, important for self-renewal of stem cells and other organ systems, seems to be uniquely expressed by the outer radioglia at this stage and functionally, is, uh, it, we demonstrate it's actually important for self-renewal of this population. And, and that, along with extracellular matrix proteins that these cells secrete, generated this model, which is, again, a working model for, for something about how these outer radioglial cells have sustained themselves and allowed brain expansion. And shown on the left is what most people now think uh, uh, creates the niche for ventricular radioglia, and that is that they have sensory cilia in their apical end feet, shown here, that project into the CSF space here. And the choroid plexus secretes growth factors at early stages in development that are sensed, including sonic hedgehog and wind signaling, by these um, sensory cilia in the ventricular radioglia and actually sustain the self-renewal of that population of cells. When the outer radioglia are born, as you know, they move away. They, they're no longer in contact with the ventricle, and that's shown on the right. And so it's really intriguing to us that when that happens, these outer radioglial cells start expressing the same growth factors that the ventricular radioglia rely on receiving through the CSF. So we think what happens when these cells move away is that they create their own niche. They start producing their own growth factors, they have receptors for those factors, and that that sustains the self-renewal that goes on and the expansion of that uh, niche that's at a distance from the CSF. Uh, again, that's a working hypothesis. The other insight we got was based on two of the markers in particular that uh, stained the radioglia throughout their cytoplasm. And that's now challenged this model, so I just want to talk about the model for a moment. This is the prevailing model for cortical development in primates, humans as well as uh, non-human primates and monkeys. And it's the radial unit hypothesis of pasco rakic diagrammed here based on studies in the monkey. And it basically shows these radioglial cells at the ventricle. They all have fibers that go up to the cortex along which neurons migrate. And the progenitors here, and they weren't known at the time to be radioglia, but the progenitors that over cell cycle after cell cycle produce neurons, those neurons would then migrate along the parent or radial uh, neighboring fibers to produce a kind of ontogenetic column of cells. And the point-to-point -point contact between the ventricle and the growing cortex allowed a kind of a map, a proto-map of the ventricular zone to be projected onto the cortex. So it's a very uh, powerful model of cortical development. It's been highly influential for the last 30 or 40 years. Um, but it turns out it's not exactly what happens in human or primate development. And the hint we had for that were these two markers, HOPX and CRYA-B, which came out of our single cell analysis. HOPX is shown in red, and it's one of the markers that's unique to outer radioglial cells. And CRYA-B is in green, and it's unique to the ventricular radioglia. So it's a new marker that we didn't have before for a population that we thought we knew a lot about. What's nice about CRYA-B, just like HOPX, that these are markers that fill the cytoplasm of the cells. And what we were struck by is that at later stages of development, the green staining never went further than the subventricular zone. So it didn't appear by the cry of B stain anyway that these fibers went all the way up to the peeled surface. Uh, 
which was very surprising to us because it contradicted the prevailing model. So to confirm it, we used DI-I, which is a technique that's been used for a long time. And at early stages, like gestation week 15, if you put crystals of DI-I at the peel surface at the top, it backfills fibers all the way down to the ventricle, shown here by the arrows. So this continuous palisade of glial fibers is just what you'd predict from the model, from the regular unit hypothesis model. But if you do it a couple of weeks later, one or two weeks later, and I'm showing it here at gestation week 18, crystals of DI on the uh, surface of the cortex fill fibers only as far as the outer subventricular zone. And at higher magnification, those fibers end in little cell bodies, which we now know are the outer radioglial cells. And if you put crystals of DI at the opposite side, the ventricular surface, you can see the filling only goes as far as the outer subventricular zone, and it ends there. And this is exactly what we predicted based on the staining by these two new markers. So what, what we now have is a discontinuous scaffold. In fact, if you look at the diagram here, uh, what we now think happens is that at the early stages, when the deeper cortical layers are being produced, there's a continuous fiber network, just like there is in the mouse throughout development, just like the radial unit model suggests. But around the time that the middle cortical layers are being produced, there's a wave of outer radioglial cell production where those outer radioglia inherit the basal fibers of the ventricular cells, and they move away. And at this point, all of the migrating fibers along which neurons are migrating end in the outer subventricular zone in these outer radioglial cells. And beyond that stage, when all the upper cortical layers are being produced, they're being produced by, we think, the outer radioglial cells, and they're migrating along the outer radioglial cell processes. So the lineage of the deeper cortical layer cells is different than the lineage of the upper cortical layer cells. One of the reasons we think that's interesting is, as many of you probably know, the deeper cortical layers with the cells that project uh, to subcortical structures, uh, to the brainstem and uh, other subcortical areas, are the sort of scaffold for the uh, body plan. The upper cortical layers include most of the association cells, you know, the cells that are thought to be important for cognitive function. And it's been well known that primates have a very high density of smaller upper cortical layer pyramidal cells. It's, it's known as a primate-specific feature of cortical adult anatomy, that the upper cortical layers, the supergranular layers, are hyperdense. And so we think all this relates to the lineage shown here, that the upper cortical layers in primates have a different lineage than the deeper cortical layers. And that may be very important for cognitive functioning and for other things that happen that are more upper cortical layer specific. The other thing I want to mention is that our single cell gene uh, uh, analysis has shown that, as I showed you already, that the ventricular radioglia differ in terms of the transcription pattern expression from the outer radioglia. So the outer radioglia have their distinct genes that the ventricular radioglia don't have. And we use that as a confirmation that these are distinct cell types or subtypes. What's also interesting is that after this point, the ventricular radioglia have a different pattern of expression than either the ventricular radioglia earlier or the outer radioglia. So they have a, a, yet a third pattern of, of transcription factor expression. So we now think because they're morphologically distinct and they're functionally distinct, um, and, and they have different transcriptomes, that they represent a third type of radioglial cell, which we're now calling a truncated radioglial cell, or T radioglial cell. So we have ventricular radioglia, outer radioglia, and truncated radioglia. But that kind of diversity doesn't really exist in the rodent. What we're now testing is the idea that the daughter cells produced by these truncated radioglia uh, may not ev even be cortical cells. And they could be. Uh, we, we're, testing two ideas. One is that they could be olfactory bulb interneurons, which are known to be produced in large numbers starting around this age, and that migrate to the olfactory bulb. They're generated in the cortex all around these periventricular regions, but they don't go to the cortex. They migrate through the rostral migratory stream to the olfactory bulb. So this could be what's starting to happen here. The other thing is, uh, starting at this stage, you begin to have a cuboidal epithelium uh, uh, lining the ventricle. And it could be that some of these cells are now making those. So we think there's a very interesting transition in the fate of the daughter cells at around this early stage in uh, cortical development. But, but all of these are ideas we're testing, but the notion derived from you know, very simple anatomy that was revealed by the uh, markers that we didn't have before. And now we've gotten to the point of the talk where I want to, uh, as I mentioned, uh, describe some translational insights that we've also gained from the single cell analysis. So the first disease I want to talk about is glioblastoma, you know, terrible brain tumor, uh, untreatable, um, not a childhood tumor. It's just, these tumors occur in uh, later life, age 20, 30, 40, and, and, and above. 
But what's interesting is when we got our outer radioglial gene signature and looked in the literature, all the genes that were expressed by outer radioglial cells, and they include, as I mentioned, extracellular matrix, epithelial mesenchymal transition genes, stem cell maintenance genes, they were all expressed in very aggressive glioblastoma that have been described already in the literature. And so we, we went to some single cell studies that have been published in genes expressed by glioblastomas. And glioblastomas, as many of you know, may know, come in two major categories. One are the proneural and the other are the mesenchymal forms. The mesenchymal forms are much more aggressive and, uh, and, and uh, highly invasive. So we looked at those, and what I'm showing you here are the <coughs> mesenchymal uh, ones because they all have the outer radioglial gene signatures, which are shown here in the upper uh, heat maps. And we looked at the correlation between the genes that were the top 100 genes in our outer radioglia and the top 100 genes in these um, bulk or as rather single cell analyzed glioblastomas. And as circled over on the right, there was a high correlation between the outer radioglial genes that we found in our fetal tissue and what's been found in these uh, tumor specimens. Based on that, we hypothesized there might be outer radioglial like cells in, in these glioblastomas. So we got some fresh tissue from the uh, surgical uh, you know, OR that were resected. We stained them in sections just like we did our fetal tissue. And shown here on the right uh, is a glioblastoma section in time-lapse imaging where we use the same uh, lentivirus that stains progenitor cells. Um, so if you look at the cell, uh, I don't know if you can see my little uh, arrow. Yeah, there it is. Pointing at that particular cell, for instance, in this time-lapse image, it undergoes the same kind of jumping and division pattern that we've seen in our fetal outer radioglial cells. And uh, we've now been able to get several more samples, and there's a high correlation between the samples that we get that are high, highly invasive and the presence of these outer radioglial cells. And uh, it now we, we have some genetic evidence that, that these may even be the cells of origin for those tumors, which, as you can imagine, raises interesting questions. These uh, outer radioglia are fetal cells. I've showed you in early cortical development. Why are they present in these adult tumors? Is there some kind of reversion of, of a cell type back to an earlier state, or are there parts of the adult brain where these outer radioglia may still re reside that we don't know about yet? Um, we don't have the answers to those questions yet, but it looks as though this may be a, a cell type that could explain the highly aggressive nature, invasive nature, uh, of this particular kind of tumor. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the use of organoids um, to study cortical malformations, which seem to us an ideal stage to use these in vitro stem cell derived models to, to interrogate. And so we looked at lysencephaly as well as microcephaly. I just want to talk about lysencephaly because I'm just going to mention microcephaly at the end. So lysencephaly, for those who don't know, is when uh, the human brain develops in an unfolded state, shown on the right. As you can imagine, it's a pretty devastating disease. Uh, luckily, it's not that common. There's mental retardation, epilepsy, uh, usually an early death. And, uh, it's thought to be a neuronal migration disorder, but the brain also has fewer cells. So it seems like a mixture of neurogenesis defects as well as migration defects. <clears throat> so we were able to get fibroblast skin samples from patients with various forms of lysencephaly. And I want to mention that there are uh, two major kinds. Um, the, this is a normal brain shown in MRI scanning on the left. You can see how highly folded it is at this stage. A similar aged patient with primary lysencephaly, which is known to be a mutation in a gene called LIS1. And you can see how smooth the occipital or rear of the brain is. Frontally, there are some folds, as you see, but not as many as normal. On the right is a more severe uh, syndrome <clears throat> called miller deeker encephaly, where the uh, lack of folding is really uh, complete, essentially. And uh, the cortex is thinner. There's larger ventricles. Uh, the reason that's a more severe phenotype is it's shown on the right. It actually is a uh, deletion of the short arm of chromosome 17 that includes um, over a dozen genes here in red. One of which is the lysencephaly, LIS1 gene, which by itself produces this phenotype. So it must be the combination of that mutation, or loss rather, plus the deletion of one or more of the other genes that makes it a, a, a more severe phenotype. So we had several patients with each of these syndromes. We, we were able to get skin biopsies, and we were uh, able to grow multiple lines of pluripotent stem cells. Uh, um, here, here's uh, the wild type fibroblast. We had uh, the uh, uh, LIS1 mutation here and the Miller Deeker syndrome patients here. For all of them, we were able to get um, fibroblast cultures and then convert them into uh, pluripotent stem cells. Uh, these are the uh, examples of one of the cultures, one of the stem cell pluripotent cell lines. And then we were uh, able to drive them down to these neural uh, organoids that some of you may be familiar with, cerebral organoids, shown here on the right. And now I just want to focus on two, the more severe Miller-Deeker syndrome compared to normal. Uh, 
and uh, these are different stages of, uh, of our differentiation protocol. On the top is the normal. At the bottom is the miller deeker syndrome patient. On the right is, um, you know, following about <clears throat> uh, two weeks or so of differentiation when they form neural rosettes. This is a sort of neuroepithelial stage. And on, uh, in, ra in red are the radioglial cells with the SOX2 or PAX6, SOX1, SOX I suppose. And um, in uh, uh, green is a marker for the apical, uh, apical basal polarity membrane, essentially, to show that these are, just like neuroepithelial cells, they form uh, a pseudostratified uh, neuroepithelial-like structure. At that point, we allow them to aggregate and develop further on their own. And then if you section those three-dimensional organoids, uh, you find this further stage of development where not only do we have the radioglia in red, the PAX6 positive, and the intermediate progenitors above, they start producing neurons that form layers uh, above that. So they become stratified, they become laminated, um, they starting to look more and more like a match for the early fetal stage of radioglial cell divisions that I talked about. <clears throat> So then we, we, <clears throat> we grew them for you know, further a uh, month or two and then uh, examined them in terms of single cell RNA sequencing. And what's shown here are heat maps over time. So uh, going from left to right, at 15 weeks, I'm sorry, no, this is all at, this, um, at 15 weeks, where we've just segregated the genes according to cell type. And uh, just to emphasize on the right are the genes expressed by outer radioglial cells that we also start to see in organoids at this stage when they get to be 15 weeks old. <clears throat> and the uh, violin plots on the right, also for ORG-enriched uh, genes, show that at the right, when they go from 10 weeks to 15 weeks, we see a sudden increase in the expression of outer radioglial genes. And if we look at the outer radioglial cells individually and compare them to the primary cells, so here on the left are fetal cells, and on the right are, are stem cell-derived cells. Both of these are ORG cells. Uh, and, and this network, which shows a sort of Pearson correlation of gene expression, and in brown are the uh, most highly enriched uh, genes, the sort of hub genes for these outer radioglia, we see that the pattern is not identical, but highly similar. So from this data, we would predict that at this stage, around 10 to 15 weeks, we would start to see populations of outer radioglia cells in this uh, organoids. And so to confirm that, um, we sectioned the organoids, stained them, and time-lapse imaged them. And here in one of the organoids is a cell, uh, down here with the arrow pointing to it, that jumps and divides, just like our ORG cells <clears throat> that you've seen now several times in fetal tissue as well as in the uh, glioblastoma. So we're now convinced that there are outer radioglial cells in these organoids once they reach 10 to 15 weeks. So we looked at outer radioglial cells in the wild type compared to the um, miller deeker lysencephaly patient. And we compared them to all the other cells that were dividing. And so here are the ventricular radioglia in time-lapse images in wild type on the top <clears throat> and lysencephaly patients on the, on the bottom. And they undergo interkinetic nuclear migration. They move down to the ventricle divide, move away. And they are indistinguishable between the miller deeker patient <clears throat> and normals. And the uh, timing of the uh, cell cycle phases are shown on the right. They, they look exactly the same. But if we do the same thing with the outer radioglia, the wild type shown on above, you know, they jump and divide, as, as you'd expect, as, as they do in the fetus. And in fact, the normal size of the jumps and the uh, timing of their cell cycles were exactly the same as we saw in primary tissue. But in the miller deeker patients, shown here on the right, the outer radioglial cells jump further. And once they jump, they fail to divide, or they only divide it after six or seven hours instead of 20 minutes. <clears throat> That's a phenotype some of you may recognize, if you're paying attention. It's this phenotype we saw several years ago when we disaggregated microtubules using acotazole. And it makes a lot of sense that this would phenocopy that, because it's known that LIS1 is a gene that's a microtubule-associated centrosome linking protein that interferes with microtubule function. So the phenotype we see in the outer radioglial cells is as we would expect if microtubules weren't working properly. What I think is so interesting about this and what I'm happy about is that it links the outer radioglial cell to a disorder that's associated with not only lack of expansion but also lack of folding. So it suggests again that there's a link between the outer radioglial cell and the substrate for cortical expansion and cortical folding because it seems to be targeted selectively in lysencephaly. It's also, I think, one of the earlier first examples of a cell type specific uh, phenotype uh, in an organoid. And then I want to end with uh, another form of uh, not genetic microcephaly, but rather um, a um, acquired form of microcephaly, which is the Zika microcephaly you're all familiar with, uh, especially starting in Brazil uh, uh, over a year ago now. Um, and when we got interested in this, it was based on a paper that we found in literature describing the way Zika virus enters the skin 
And the paper described a, a receptor known as AXL, which among a long list of flavovirus entry receptors or entry factors, this was the one that they found to be necessary and sufficient for the Zika virus to infect skin cells. And if you blocked it, you got no infection of the Zika virus in the skin. And the reason that was uh, interesting to us is our single cell genomic expression data showed that AXL was one of the most highly enriched genes in outer radioglial cells. And so we assumed that if AXL was mediating entry of the Zika virus into the skin, it might also mediate entry into the uh, neural progenitor cells, which are exactly the population you'd want to diminish or decrease if you're going to produce a microcephalic phenotype. And so here on the left are all of the uh, previously described flavovirus entry receptors. And you can see there's a long list. Some of them mediate yellow fever and, and dengue fever. The ones that mediate um, Zika virus entry are shown with these little uh, black dots. And there are four of them. On the right are the heat maps for all of these in our single cell expression data from the human developing brain. And I hope you can appreciate that it's really only the AXL receptor that's highly enriched <clears throat> in very, sub, very particular subsets of cells. So it's enriched in astrocytes, in radioglial cells, and over on the right, microglia and endothelial cells, but not in the IPCs, intermediate progenitors, which remember are just the daughters of these cells. But they really significantly downregulate AXL expression, and they're not expressed in neurons, either the excitatory cells or the inhibitory interneurons. So based on that, we predicted the sort of tropism for the virus. You know, what are the cells the virus is likely to affect, and interestingly enough, not affect? And we were able to get actual virus, and uh, oh, by the way, this is just the antibodies for uh, AXL, which confirms, as shown here in green, expression, especially as you can see in the outer radioglial cells, and the end feet of the ventricular radioglia, and in blood vessels at these early stages. And uh, that schematic just uh, highlight <coughs> highlights the distribution of receptors in those cell types. So we then actually got a virus from Brazil and in cultured slices infected them to see which cells actually uh, harbored uh, viral entry. So in green now is an antibody for the envelope protein of the virus once it starts getting synthesized inside cells. And you can see the expression pattern already uh, highlights infection in the ventricular but also subventricular zone as well as higher up in the cortical plate regions. And when we looked at the expression patterns, it confirmed on an individual cell basis that the ventricular and outer radioglia were infected, as shown here, uh, and readily infected. But at later stages, shown here, which is <clears throat> further on in the second trimester, in the cortical plate region, there were tons of infected cells, uh, and they turn out not any of them to be neurons. Those are all SOX2 positive cells that turn out to be astrocytes. So here's a higher power view, where in green is the uh, envelope protein of the, uh, of the uh, 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 <clears throat> Zika virus, and you can see the astrocytes uh, were the only cell type highly infected in the cortical plate, not the neurons, which is actually very intriguing. So, um, so the pattern of AXL expression fit the pattern of infection. But to confirm that AXL was the receptor involved, <clears throat> we used astrocytes shown here, <clears throat> which readily get infected by the virus. And then when we blocked the AXL receptor shown on the right, uh, it really inhibited uh, entry of the virus is quantified here which again confirmed that AXL was most likely the single acting uh, entry factor for the Zika virus in these human astrocytes. This also gave us, by the way, a platform for screening drugs. Um, and what we then did in a collaboration with Joe DeRisi at UCSF is look at uh, uh, FDA approved drugs, especially the ones that are safe to use during pregnancy, to see if we could identify something that uh, could actually uh, protect a fetus at risk from the Zika virus infection. And uh, what we uh, want to highlight here is uh, azithromycin. So here is an untreated uh, bed of astrocytes infected after uh, 48 hours. And in the treatment of azithromycin, shown here on the right, it significantly inhibited um, the infection of the virus at concentrations, by the way, that are achieved in umbilical cord blood and in the brain, where the concentration of azithromycin has been shown to actually be become concentrated. Um, this is just the quantification for that. So because azithromycin is commonly available, it's very cheap. Uh, we've had over 30 years' experience, and it's, uh, it's thought to be safe to use during pregnancy. Uh, a trial is getting started right now in Brazil <clears throat> to see, in fact, if, if this can be used as a, uh, as a, a board of uh, a protective or uh, 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 pr protection, possibly even prophylactic approach uh, to uh, protect uh, fetuses from the Zika virus. Uh, so that's really as far as I, yes. So, you know, as far as we know, that, that 
is, has not been associated with any uh, adverse events. That is, uh, it's, there are several papers that have been published where <clears throat> women at different stages of their pregnancy have taken uh, the usual doses of azithromycin, and there have been no fetal complications. Right. Uh, well, we don't know. I mean, uh, you know, I have no idea how this would work, um, but we hope to find out. The study, if any of you are interested, I could describe the way the trial is, is organized. Uh, there are two arms, a, tr a treatment and a placebo arm. Uh, Seventy-five patients will be enrolled in each. They'll all be uh, PCR confirmed to have had Zika virus infection at some stage in the first or second trimester of pregnancy. <clears throat> They'll be treated for a period of two weeks, and then the outcomes will be compared. Uh, it's a blinded control study. However, um, there is a monitoring group uh, that will be unblinded. And in case there's a trend, you know, a significant trend toward protection in the treatment you know, arm, then uh, the study will be stopped and it will be made available, you know, to obviously to the people in the trial. Um, but uh, that's the scheme that's undergone uh, ethical approval in Brazil. And uh, the team from UCSF is down there working with the Brazilians to get that trial started now because the Zika season is starting up again. The non-generic name for azithromycin. Uh, it's a macrolide antibiotic. Sorry, azithromax. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Commonly available and cheap. Exactly. The Z, you know, the Z pack. So I just want to mention some of the highlights to take home. You know, that we think the single cell uh, RNA sequencing approach has been a terrific way to get insights into cortical development. And also, I think it's going to be very useful for evaluating those in vitro models, especially the organoid models. Um, and the profiling has highlighted not only cell identity markers, but also uh, given us insight into what we think are uh, important gene networks uh, for cell type identity and for function. Uh, and then we've also learned through our markers uh, the presence of these specific cell types in a variety of different diseases and uh, the relationship of those cells to the actual etiology of some of those mecha uh, disease mechanisms. Uh, and these are people both present and, and some of them who've recently left my lab. Uh, the three people who really uh, con contributed mostly to the work I presented is uh, Marina Burstein, who did all the organoid modeling, uh, Alex Pollan and Tom Nowakowski, who really uh, were responsible for bringing the single cell uh, genomic approach into, uh, into my lab. We had collaborators, including Joe DeRisi for the Zika work, uh, uh, Tony Winchell Barris for the Listencephaly project, and uh, funding sources. And uh, thank you all for your attention.